Mother's Day looks a lot different this year. <sighs> Mommy needs a quarantine. And our moms may be spending a lot of time with their kids right now. A lot. Like, so, so much time. And even though they love their kids to the moon and back, Mommy, where are you going? sometimes moms need a little alone time. Mommy! You know, to recharge. Go talk to Daddy. Mommy! Where are you? But no matter what's happening in the world, their favorite way to spend time is with their family. In good times, in hard times. Mom! Hi. You're breaking everything! In uncertain times. Thank you, Mom, for making time for us every single day. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I ask that you would watch over us as we go to bed and rest, that you'd speak to us in Bible stories and speak to us in... Good morning on this Mother's Day weekend. Would you please indulge me as I take just a brief moment during these unorthodox times of online gatherings and video recorded services to publicly thank two very special women in my life. To my mom, thank you for your selfless love, for the sacrifices you made for the sake of your four children, for your wisdom in raising us at such a young age. Thank you, mom for being generous with I love yous, and even thank you for the stringent boundaries that you set for us. Thank you for your enduring strength and patience. Thank you for always feeding my dreams, no matter how crazy they were. Thank you for keeping us connected to our extended family. And finally, but certainly not exhaustively, Thank you, Mom, for the air fryer. I love you. And to my grandmother, Mary, you are the strongest woman I know, and I am so abundantly grateful for your example. You are the rock, the glue, the matriarch of our tribe. Thank you for the sacrifices you made for the sake of our family. You love unconditionally, without judgment, and we are all better people because of you. I love you. Even as I thank the mothers of my life, 
I recognize that this is a difficult day for many. Indeed, all of us will experience the pain of Mother's Day at some point in our lives in any variety of ways. So let us remember, lift up in prayer, and support those for whom this Mother's Day is less about celebrating and more about grieving. For you who struggle to find reasons to give thanks, having had difficult or no relationships with your mother, we pray for you. For those of you who would give anything to say I love you, to say thank you one more time as you grieve the loss of your mother, we are lifting you up in prayer. For you who are grieving miscarriages and the loss of a child, we pray for you. For you who are longing for or struggling to have children, we are praying for you. This morning we have lit a blue candle for all those for whom Mother's Day this year is a reminder of loss and longing, and we pray for you. We pray for you if you are like Tamar, struggling with infertility or a miscarriage. We pray for you if you are like Rachel, counting the women among your family and friends who year by year and month after month get pregnant while you wait. We are praying for you if you are like Naomi and have known the bitter sting of a child's death. We are praying for you if you are like Joseph and Benjamin and your mom has died. We are praying for you if your relationship with your mom was marked by trauma, abuse, or abandonment, or she just couldn't parent you the way you needed. We are praying for you if you've been like Moses' mother and put a child up for adoption, trusting another family to love your child into adulthood. We want you to know that we are praying for you if you have been like Pharaoh's daughter, called to love children who are not yours by birth. We want you to know that we are praying for you if you, like many, are watching or have watched your mother age and disappear into the long goodbye of dementia. We want you to know that we are praying for you. If, like Mary, you are pregnant for the very first time and waiting breathlessly for the miracle of your first child. We want you to know that we are praying for you. If your children have turned away from you, painfully closing the door on relationship, leaving you holding your broken heart in your hands, and like Hagar, you are mothering alone. I want you to know that we are praying for you if motherhood is your greatest joy and toughest struggle all rolled into one. We want you to know that we are praying for you if you are watching your child battle substance abuse, a legal situation, mental illness, or another situation which you can merely watch unfold. Know that we are praying for you if you are like so many women who have gone before who do not wish to be a mother, are not married, or in so many other ways do not fit societal norms. I want you to know that we are praying for you if you see yourself reflected in all or none of these stories. This Mother's Day, wherever and whoever you are, we walk with you. You are loved, you are seen, you are worthy. And may you know the deep love without end of our big, wild, beautiful God, who is the very best example of a parent that we know. Heavenly Father, be with those this morning who are grieving, grieving what they never had, grieving what they have lost, grieving what they see slipping through their hands, out of their control. Father, I pray that you would strengthen each one and that you would help each one to grieve well and that you would give them, Lord, a comfort and a peace and a hope this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you join me in a call to worship, responsive reading, as it appears on your screen?
I will read the first line, you the second, and so on and so forth. Your lines will be printed in bold. God is in our midst, forming us to be God's own people. We need not fear. Come to the Lord, who will surround you with God's own righteousness. Amen. to listeners now, just as it was meant to bring comfort to the listeners then. Having just enjoyed the Last Supper together with his disciples on the eve before his crucifixion, Jesus had just told them that he was going to be betrayed, and now he's explaining to them that he will need to leave them, and where he is going, they cannot go. They want to go with him, but they can't. Not yet, anyway. And Jesus knows that their hearts are troubled over this. And he begins our passage this week with this word. Let not your hearts be troubled. Would you open your Bibles or your Bible apps to the book of John, chapter 14? And we're going to read together verses 1 to 14. John chapter 14, verses 1 to 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, 
I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let not your hearts be troubled. Have you ever, in the midst of your anxiety, worry, doubt, fear, in the middle of difficult circumstances, have you ever had someone try to reassure you and tell you things are going to be okay? No solutions, no real answers, just words, meant to comfort. Don't worry, it will all be okay. Did those words help much? Nice sentiments, but not much help really, are they? Thomas and Philip are worried. Jesus is saying he is leaving, leaving them alone in uncertain and dangerous times, leaving them, though nothing it seems has really changed for them. They are still a people oppressed. And so they respond, much the same as we might. Thomas, with doubt-filled questions, and Philip, essentially saying, prove it. Jesus, give us some solid evidence that things are gonna be okay. I love these guys. I appreciate anyone who asks questions, who pushes back and wrestles with their faith. It only makes our faith stronger. See, Jesus doesn't mind our questions either. He is big enough for our doubts, for our wrestlings. Bring your questions to Jesus. See, Jesus doesn't dismiss their questions. He responds. He answers their doubt-filled questions and provides Philip the proof he wanted. This passage is part of Jesus' farewell discourse, which begins in chapter 13. But I want you to remember that the author is writing this from the perspective of one who knows the rest of the story. He knows of Jesus' crucifixion, but also his resurrection and ascension. From this perspective, Jesus' words take on fuller and truer meaning. While this is a passage used to bring comfort at funerals, it has as much to do with our experiencing abundant life and living into our mission as with providing comfort in the face of death. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. There are a few important translation notes here. 
First of all, the word used as you here is plural. And the word belief as used here does not mean something that we simply accept as true. Rather, the word is more accurately defined as trust, which is something that is formed through relationship and that allows us to surrender based on what we accept to be true. Jesus is saying, do not let your hearts be troubled. Put your trust into God. Put your trust into me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Trust me with your troubles. Trust me with your pain. Place it in my hands. What are you putting your trust into these days? Do not let your hearts be troubled. You trust in God, trust also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? The word rooms or habitations used here has less to do with mansions. The word manai used here is referring to temporary resting places for travelers. In Jesus' day, people traveled in caravans, and a contingent of people would be sent on ahead to prepare a place for the travelers where they could rest. They would ensure that the camp was ready, water sources were available, and food was prepared. Jesus goes ahead of us and prepares places of rest and restoration for us along the journey of faith until we reach our final destination with him forever. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You trust in God, trust also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. And then it almost seems as though Thomas interrupts Jesus and says, wait, hold up. No, 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 no. We don't know where you're going, Jesus. We have no clue. You haven't told us yet where you're going, so how can we know the way? See, Thomas wants details on this place. He wants directions. Give him an address so that he can Google Maps and find his way there. But Thomas has misunderstood. And so Jesus explains, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus doesn't talk about streets of gold. He does not speak of pearly gates. He does not say, look to the heavens, that is where you will find me. Jesus tells Thomas not where he is, but who he is. I am the way. I encouraged us last week to pause wherever we see John recording Jesus saying, I am. The I am's are important as each of the I am statements illuminate the glorious character of Christ as divine. I am Yahweh. I am God. They are statements indicating the very source of grace, the very source of life that is in their presence. God is with them. When Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he is not directing them to a place at all. It isn't about a place. It's about a person. It isn't about heavenly real estate. It's about relationship. It's not so much about pearly gates. It's all about presence. Think of your own homes. Is it the building that makes the home or the family that lives within it? While it is true that there is a place prepared for us by Jesus, with Jesus, when we die, there is a greater truth. Jesus is with us now. 
The disciples then, us now, have never and will never be left alone. Jesus will never leave us or forsake us. And once more, to the degree that we follow him who is the way, the truth, and the life, we will experience his kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus says, I am the way. What word would you use to describe Jesus? Love. I am the way of love. Historically, Christians were not called Christians. They were called followers of the way, which is to say followers of Jesus, because he is the way of love. Jesus says, I am the truth. Later on, leading up to his crucifixion, when he is being interrogated by Pontius Pilate, Jesus says, I have come to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Jesus is the truth. Not our doctrines which divide, not our debate wins, but Jesus. What you see lived in and through Jesus, that is truth. Jesus is a life. Preacher and theologian Frederick Bruckner explains the way, the truth, and the life like this. Jesus does not say church is the way. He does not say his teachings are the way or what people for centuries have taught about him. He does not say religion is the way, not even the religion that bears his name. He says he himself is the way. And he says that the truth is not words, neither his words nor anyone else's words. It is the truth of being truly human as he was truly human, and thus at the same time truly God's. And the life we are dazzled by in him, haunted by in him, nourished by in him, is a life so full of aliveness and light that not even the darkness of death could prevail against it. I am the way, the truth, and the life, says Jesus. And then he continues, no one comes to the Father except through me. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one comes to know God, the source of love, the truth of love, the one who bathes our life in love, without knowing Jesus. Because Jesus is God with skin on. Jesus says, if you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Want to know what God looks like? Look at the way of Jesus. If you have seen Jesus, you have seen the Father. Jesus has God living in him. Jesus is God with skin on. And then Philip speaks up. Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Philip always seems concerned with having enough. It was Philip who was concerned with not having enough money to buy enough loaves and fishes for the people. And now it appears Jesus is not enough. If only you would show us the Father, then that would be enough to strengthen our faith. Do we ever live as though Jesus is not enough? Not enough to get us through these unsettled times? Not enough to carry our burdens? Not enough to understand our anxiety? Not enough to provide for our needs? Have you ever been there? In a state of desperation, crying out, God, just show me you are real. Just show me yourself, God. Jesus says, you've been with me all this time, Philip, and you still don't understand? To see me is to see the Father. So how can you ask, where is the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Believe me, I am in my Father and my Father is in me. If you can't believe that, believe what you see, these works. Philip, the proof, the evidence you seek is right in front of you. 
Have you not seen the love and grace and miracles of your heavenly Father poured out through me? Have you not heard his love speaking to your heart through me? I wonder if sometimes we keep asking God for proof, for evidence that he is with us, that we are not alone in this. And all the while, he has been revealing himself to us, providing for us in ways that we just haven't had eyes to see or ears to hear, in ways that perhaps we take for granted. What do you think? Do you think it's possible, plausible, probable, that in the midst of your chaos, God is right there? That if you looked, you could see his hand at work in your life? that you could identify evidence of his goodness, his mercies, his grace, and his love. What about looking back with 2020 hindsight? Can you see now how God was with you back then in those difficult days? Can you see where he was bringing healing, where he was leading you to more abundant life, where he was strengthening and comforting and supporting and providing for you? God is with you now, just as he was then. His past faithfulness is proof of his continued and future faithfulness. When your hearts are troubled, put your trust into Jesus. Look to Jesus, who pours out God's love and mercy, who healed the sick, included the outcast, forgave the sinner, restored the broken, reconciled the lost, the one who went to the cross to show us how much God loves us, and in doing so conquered death, so that death no longer has any hold on us. Jesus is a reflection of God. Jesus is who God is, perfect love. Trust in I am, the way, the truth, the life. Jesus then encourages the disciples saying, very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. Whoever trusts in Jesus, whoever walks in the way, the truth and the life of love will do the works of love of healing, of providing, that Jesus has been doing. If we place our trust in Jesus, we will continue his mission of restoration and reconciliation and do even greater things. Which is where I would pause and ask, really? Greater things? What greater things could we possibly do? I certainly have never raised anyone to life from death. I have not even healed a blind person and I certainly have not been able to multiply pizza unless you consider cutting slices in half. And yet the greater thing that we will accomplish as we trust in Christ is to establish a community of love centered in Christ who is love. A community that will transform our world. A community of love that offers the world an alternative to hate and prejudice racism, discrimination, greed, selfishness, and pride. A community of mercy that lifts the burdens of guilt and shame. A community of grace that forgives, reconciles, and restores in Jesus' name. We accomplish this greater thing as we place our trust into Jesus, trusting that he can and will provide for us and so we do not have to allow selfishness, jealousy, guilt, and greed to rob, kill, and destroy us. Loving each other because we have trusted in his love. Believing that his love is enough for all. This morning I'd like to close with a poem by Andrew King called The Face of God. We thought you wore the skin of thunder, spoke in verbs of storm wind, majestic and mighty as lightning upon summits. 
unreachable as the cold and silent fire of distant stars, hidden behind a curtain in the temple, an untouchable invisibility approachable by the highest priest only, hands freshly blooded from an altar. And then somehow the veil was parted we gained glimpses of the glory of the nearness of your love as the hurting were healed, the outcast befriended, the lost restored, and everywhere the powers of death had their dominion challenged by the son of a Jewish carpenter from Galilee. If you have seen me, said Jesus, you have seen the Father. And we do see you there in the Gospels, healing in synagogues and in houses, feeding the hungry on hillsides, embracing the lepers and the sinners, churning over the tables in the temple, nailed to a cross of injustice, but risen greeting women at the graveside, sharing bread with your friends, the dominion of death overturned, approachable, reachable, the accessible God. But you are not done, not content to wear such skin only in the pages of the Gospels. The many-colored, multi-shaped body of Christ, the church, wide as the nations of the world, bears your image where it acts in your love, still feeding, still healing, still teaching, mercy, making you visible, not in great structures nor in high saints alone, but in the ordinary persons in the pews. As here, on a day like any other, a woman making dinner and packing it, knocking on the door of a neighbor, newly home from surgery for cancer, the face of the one receiving it lit with thankfulness, the face of the one freely giving like the face of God. Welcome to the heart of God. Breathe deep, beloved. I am bringing everyone in. There is nothing to be afraid of. This is your birthplace. There are no requirements unmet. This is your birthright. No one is refused. Come in. Let down. Expand. There is more than enough room. Join me in the deep, refreshing, endless, eternal. Wade in and refreshed. Let your mind untangle. Let your body rest. Let your spirit be at ease. I am this moment, and by waves of love I will reset your cadence. By my current, get you back on course. My touchable representations on earth, I will birth you again, my sons, my daughters, soaked in my love, and bless you, beloved, to stand and emerge, still dripping of the heart of God, as one fluid, hope-restored movement alter the environment for the better 
everywhere you go. Because everywhere you will go, there I am. Heavenly Father, give us eyes to see you in the midst of our circumstances. Give us eyes to see you, to recognize that you are with us, that you are at work. God, help us to walk in the way of love to walk in the truth of love and to find life in your love. I pray that we would continue your mission of restoration and reconciliation. I pray that as we come together in love, as we come together centered in the love of Christ, that we would do even greater things. As we come together as the body of Christ, that we would offer our world an alternative, an alternative bathed in love, an alternative pouring out love. Lord, I pray that we would stand in the name of Jesus against racism, against discrimination, against prejudice, against injustice. Lord, I pray that we would stand and swing the doors wide open for all those who have been excluded and pushed to the margins. I pray, God, that we would be a people who bring healing, who bring mercy and grace, that restores hearts, that restores relationships, Lord, that brings life in Jesus' name. We pray for your spirit to continue to work in us, to bless us, and through us to bless others. May we place our trust in you knowing that you are as close as our very breath. May we place our trust in you and live that we might see your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Lord, may we find comfort in our distressing times. May we find comfort in our pain and our hurt and our fear and our anxiety. May we look to Jesus and find peace for our souls and hope for our tomorrows, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>